Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour, chapter 5, the great book of James. We're going to complete it today. James being the equivalent in the Hebrew for Jacob, the father of the 12 tribes, and this written to the 12 tribes, scattered abroad. Many of them scattered. They have no idea who they really are, though God promised they would become as numerous as the stars of heaven and sands of the sea. So, it's real important that you know from our Father's Word where you fit. What, what, because every child of God has a purpose and many of them have a destiny if they be one of God's elect. Otherwise, you have free will and what a pleasure it is to serve Him. Chapter 5, verse 1, Word of Wisdom from our Father. Let's go with it. It reads, go to now or, or listen now. How about this? You rich men. Weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. In other words, your ill-gotten gains. This is, this is the type of richness we're talking about here. Not, not riches uh, blessed by Almighty God. There, that you don't have to apologize for, and it never gives you any trouble but brings you blessings. But if you're a crook, if you're, by that I mean if you are rich by having um, taken advantage of people, all, all it is, it, it's unjust, and it, bring, it is offensive and oppressive to everyone. You, you don't have any happiness in ill-gotten gains, and uh, people really don't want you around them. Why? Because you become oppressive. That's what ill-gotten gains, looking over your shoulder all the time, um, and so it is. Verse 2, your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. In other words, you're, you're an accident going somewhere to happen. And your very clothing, rather than righteous uh, uh, apparel of the gospel armor, you're wearing old junk that is so perishable that it's not going to last. Whereas the gospel armor lasts forever. Verse 3, your gold and your silver is cankered and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, <clears throat> excuse me, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. You have heaped treasures together for the last days. Now, how, how does the gold and silver get cankers and rust on it? Hoarding it, never using it. What good is it, what good is it to, to um, rip people off and gather more than you could ever use. And there it just sits. What good does it do anybody other than to take the rich man and give him a headache wondering when he'll get caught or how he can, how he can outstrip the next person? That makes them unjust and it makes them oppressive. Nobody wants them, no, and understandably so. <clears throat> so. What about the last days? That means the end times they're never going to understand. For the flesh, that's pretty final because there's no hereafter for them. Verse 4, Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept, which is of you kept back by fraud, you ripped them off, Crieth, and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. That's to say the Lord of hosts being translated properly. <clears throat> he hears and knows everything. When you rip somebody off, God makes a note of it. It's in your book. It's in the book of life by your name. So people that think they get away with something, I, knowing that God is all knowing and seeing as far as what's happening in this world, even to the point he can read your mind, to think you could hide something from him, 
You cannot con God. He knows every move you make, if it's oppressive, to, um, to those that cry out. Verse 5, you have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. You have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. In other words, um, th this is an interesting point when you catch the whole, do you, uh, in, in a, a rural area before we slaughter a calf for our meat, we put them up and fatten them and feed them and pamper them and really take good care of them. And what God is saying, you have shut yourself up and you pampered yourself for the slaughter of the end times. That's a nice way of saying you're going to hell. And, and you're, all, you're all fattened up for it. And it, th this simply means uh, fattened up does not mean weight or content or anything like that. It means that you've pampered yourself and, and abused others. You were oppressive to them and unjust. And our Father is well aware of it. And um, uh, it's kind of man's natural desires if he's not kidding and not kidding himself because the better desires are to serve the living God and be an example to God's children. Verse 6, you have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. In other words, um, this should be translated, you have killed the just one. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. By, by unjust um, from one end to the other, ultimately it brought about the killing of the just one, which is to say the Lord Jesus Christ, and he doth not resist you. He didn't open his mouth. He allowed it. There's a reason for that. It's so that on that day when it's time for Satan to march into the lake of fire, he has no excuse. If it was his children that brought out those cries, crucify him, then, and, and Satan digging them to do it, then when Satan has to be in the lake of fire, then it has evened out. As a matter of fact, in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, God makes it very clear, Christ came to this earth to die on the cross whereby he could destroy death, which is to save the devil. That's, that's what it's all about. Plus, uh, providing salvation for all that would hear and all that would listen. You, you will note in the last days, as it was mentioned in verse 3, this fifth chapter applies a great deal to the last days if you understand it on a deeper level. There's a time of division and judgment coming, and it is God that does the judging. Verse 7, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. He is returning. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. In other words, a husbandman, a farmer, he plants the crop, and he knows that cultivating and watering, it takes time to produce a crop. Now, the early rain is what germinates the seed in the soil and causes the plant to spring forth. And then the latter rain, which is very necessary, if the plant then doesn't receive the latter rain, it blasts in the field. In other words, it dries up and dies. It doesn't produce any fruit. So it must have the latter rain. And beloved, you that wait for the return of the Lord, you must have the latter rain also, which is to say the knowledge of, of um, defeating the evil one and how to abstain yourself from him or you will blast in the field also. It takes that latter rain, which is the truth of God's word revealed by him in time, in season, patiently waiting as God leads us, releasing knowledge and information whereby you have that knowledge to sustain you and, uh, and patiently bring you as a servant of the living God 
especially the election of this end time, how precious it is that our Father is the one that tells you how to attain the early rain and the latter rain. Make sure you get your part. Verse 8, listen carefully. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts. That, that, that's solidified in your minds. For the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. When you get to that generation of the latter rain, it's closing in. Verse 9. Grudge not or gripe not one against another. Brethren, lest you be condemned, and God will do it. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Almighty God is there. He is the judge. There is no other. We have one judge, and that's Almighty God, our Heavenly Father. And He is very well aware. And so it is. Verse 10. Take, my brethren, the prophets. Look at them. Who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. I mean, look, look what they went through. Take old Jeremiah as an example. They lowered him down into a well, into mud, clear up to his neck practically, and left him hanging there on lines. And, and uh, pain, of course, it had to be painful. And he never complained. He patiently served God, knowing God had chosen him for a prophet before he, or, or had chosen him as one of the elect before he even entered his mother's womb. And while in his mother's womb, God chose him as a prophet. You can read that in the first four verses of the great book of Jeremiah. He was one of God's elect, chosen well before. But he could patiently wait. So you, you know, our father likes people that can cut it. He likes, he can't really use wimps. It just, uh, they, they, they won't last. They're going to mildew in the field. You know, a lot of people would say, well, can God encourage me about this? Of, of course he can. He does in the word. He, he just told you, take the prophets. David himself, writer of the Psalms, as it's written in Acts chapter 2, he was a prophet. Well, what does it say in the 37th Psalm about this situation? It just seems like the wicked always get ahead. And the acrostic, there are three verses that stand out because they have a different number of stanzas, lines rather, in, in the Psalm, making them an acrostic in, in the Hebrew manuscripts. And it is brought out quite well in your companion Bibles, so it, so that you can understand it in English. And the first, which if I remember correctly, is the seventh verse, says, Why is it that the wicked always seem to get ahead? And secondly, it says in the second stanza, many verses later, 22 or 3, 1 or 2, Don't worry about it, because they are like the fat of a lamb turning on a spit that drops into the fire and their smoke goes up forever and ever. In other words, that's, that's the payday for the wicked. And the third part of the acrostic is so beautiful because it says, you know something? You're going to be there to see it. So, you see, even though times may get a little binding sometimes in these end times, don't worry about it. God will always take care of His own he will always provide for them, and He protects His own to where not a hair on their head can be uh, bothered, as it's written in Luke 21 concerning the false Messiah. And His instructions in Revelation chapter 9, verse 4 are, Don't dare touch my, the ones that have the seal of God in their forehead, which means the truth of this word in their minds. You can't fool them. That's what He was saying. Next verse, please. And we go with verse 11. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Can you do that? Ye have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the, uh, of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful. pitiful. This is a bad translation. It's, 
It's compassionate. It should be. It's like a Roma and ru, lo ruhama and rahama in the book of Hosea. It means compassionate and tender mercy. Here, our, our Father looks out for and with love and under compassion for those that endure. Now, and what about Job? Did the Lord do him wrong? Job means probation. Okay. And Satan wanted Job, and God told him, as Satan went before God's throne one day, as you can read in Job chapter 1, verse 6, hey, what do you think about my boy Job? He's something else. You can't, you couldn't touch him. He knows you. And this is a type of the elect. You know him. He can't touch you. Why? Because you find him to be an abomination. So did Job. But anyway, Satan said to God, you remove that wall you have around him because God does have a wall around his elect. He gives us power over all of our enemies. Satan said, if you'll take that wall down, I'll have him eaten out of my hand. That's my paraphrasing. And God said, I don't think you can. So I'll do it. I'll take the wall away. Have at him. I trust Job. And Satan did everything. I mean, he ever did everything but kill him. And God said, you can't do that. I mean, he was sore from head to toe. And his wife finally told him, why don't you just curl up and die? He's lost all of his kids, his property. And then his friends, who are not even of the house of Israel, came to give him advice from God. Three of them, buddy buddies. And 38 chapters of ratchet jawing to Job, man's talk, traditions of men. Job said, I'm not giving in. I haven't done anything wrong. And I know the Lord wouldn't be the causing this. And finally, after the 38th chapter, and this being the lesson and why God would want you to take note of Job, God finally comes on the scene and says, Job, get up from there. Girt up yourself ready for battle, okay? And, and why are you listening to these knuckleheads when you've got me? And I would say the same thing to you. Why do you listen to Ratchet Jaws when you've got the letter that God sent you to grow from? Early rain, latter rain. And finally he said, they don't know what they're talking about. Where were you when I put all the stars in place, the moon, the earth? And then you see the majesty of our Father. And ultimately, what did God do? Why was He compassionate? Why can we say that He had mercy? He doubled everything Job had. Lost. I mean, made it a plentiful to Him again. And um, God has a way of doing that. It may get a little tough sometimes. Be patient. Do, you know, this is where faith comes in. God's going to take care of you. As long as you use this, as long as you think, and as long as you're familiar with God's Word, you will do just fine. God will see to it. Okay, we go with the next verse, and it would be verse 12. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay be nay, lest you fall into con condemnation. And so it is. That's, I mean, don't listen to the traditions of men. You know, you have, well, what is he talking about here? Law of precedent. Okay. You have God's law. That's sufficient. If God says it, end of story. That's it. Man, what does man do then? And what is God talking about? Man will say, well, according to this good brother, it's this way. And according to this other good brother, it's this other way. And according to what well, my thoughts is this way. You get three choices. What are you going to do? That's confusion. Because God says, yay, yay, and nay, nay. And end of story. That's the way it is. If you listen to men, you know, this is what is wrong with our courts today. They don't go by the common law, which comes, well, what does the common law come from? God's holy word. 
from Great Britain to here to our Constitution and what we live by comes right from God's Word. That is the law that is important. But now we go by law of precedent that some judge who might have been so liberal, he's pink colored, and another one purple this way, put in by crooked politicians to, to saw, salve their sores, and you don't know, you have, law of precedent gets you nowhere, basically, okay? Yay, yay, or nay, nay, period. That's the end of it. And as long as you do that and, and, and uh, let that be your life, you'll be a lot better off. You'll be a lot more blessed by Almighty God. And, uh, and so it is. Um, verse 13 to continue. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. I mean, if, if you're happy, pick the group up. Let it rip right out there. And um, if anybody's heavy hearted, pick them up. Verse 14. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of what? In the name of the Lord. And, and, uh, and so it is that if, if you have one that is ill, then, but the oil is very necessary, especially for Christians. You, you pray for somebody for their illness, fine, but you're probably not going to get any results until you follow God's instructions and anoint them with the oil of our people. The oil will not heal them, but it shows your obedience to Almighty God. Well, I didn't know Christians had to anoint. What do you think the word Christ means? Where have you been? Christ, Christos, means the anointed one. The etymology of his name comes from as rubbing by anointing with oil, the oil of our people. And uh, so pushing people over and, and uh, stumbling over them doesn't heal them. But doing it God's way with the oil of our people can certainly bring results. Uh, 15, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. This word sick is different than the one above. This means one that is just wore out. I mean, just, just absolutely uh, weary, down, uh, depressed. And the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him on repentance and bringing them forth. These are two, se two separate Greek words of the sick. One is absolutely an illness that that um, can uh, make you feeble, and the other is of the mind, basically, we'll say. And so it is. Prayer is powerful. Prayer is talking to Almighty God. It isn't some big poem written out in a book. It's from your heart to the heart of the living God. Verse 16 to continue. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. In other words, God hears that prayer. And, but that means that you're sincere, that you're patient. You know, we have too many people that pray and they want God to, I mean, put the, the uh, three minute, like the three minute egg that he wants, they want him to do his <laughs> right now. I want a miracle. Be patient. God does what he does in his own time, in his own place, with his own purpose. But the prayers of a person that really loves the Father brings forth much. We're about to go into Elijah here. Why? Because he's going to say, Elijah is no different than you. He was just a common person. But he prayed for it to stop, not rain, and then prayed for it to rain. 
what was the subject earlier? Let's, let's kick this in a little deeper and have some of the latter rain as we finish this book of uh, James. Well, now, if I remember right, the two witnesses do the same thing. They can pray for it to not rain, then pray for it to rain. Well, if Elijah's the one that can do that, maybe he's one of the two witnesses. Well, we could take that another step further and kick it up a little more and say, well, who showed up on the Mount of Transfiguration, which was a sign of Christ and the two witnesses? Well, let's see. Well, it was Elijah and Moses that appeared with Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration. What God wants you to know, Elijah was just a common man, but he knew the prophecy and studied the prophets. He was the prophet of prophets. It was God that accomplished the deed. It was Elijah that knew the prophecy that God had stated that he would fulfill. So the thing for you to remember is that if you want the latter rain, and if you want to know the truth, then fervent prayer will release that latter rain to you as God would have it, whereby you utilize it to lead people, to direct people, and bring them into that time of the last days, that latter rain, whereby they mature into that. Okay, let's, let's take it easily here, verse 17. Elias, which is to say Elijah in the Hebrew, was a man subject to like passions as you as we are, and he prayed earnestly, that's the difference, that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And, and so it is, there's that three and a half years, just as sure as it can be, that there would be no latter rain fall on some years during that time. Well, for what purpose? It wouldn't have done any good if that was the first three and a half years of the false messiah. But it's important that you understand what God is saying here, that Elijah is no different than you are. He was just a common man. But he knew and earnestly understood prophecy. And God used him to bring forth that prophecy for us even. I feel we'll use him even as one of the two witnesses. And the latter rain is this, that God will release that latter rain to those that earnestly pray for knowledge and wisdom from the living God. Common, ordinary people, especially those of the elect, that seek the very truth that is written in these words in this letter that God has sent us, for behold, He has foretold us all things. The point is, is for you to understand it, for you to receive the latter rain, understanding each detail of the prophecy, for it is simple when it comes forth as God lays it out. Not yea, not nay, not maybe, not hmm, perhaps, yea or nay, right on. You can count on your heavenly Father. He always gets it done. Verse 18, speaking of Elijah, and he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain and the earth brought forth her fruit and that's as it is. Common man prayed earnestly and God brought that latter rain for him where he could see what tomorrow brings, where he could see what it is that is expected of God, the lessons that should be taught, the word that should be heard, especially the days that the Lord would return as it stated earlier in this chapter and how you should sustain yourself. And the fact that this man, Elijah, was just a common man. And so it is that when you pray earnestly, sincerely, with no strings attached to Almighty God, 
to receive that latter rain, understanding, knowledge, peace of mind, to understand the end times, he's going to give it. Okay. That rain is coming. That rain is falling. Make sure that you enjoy every bit of it. And it will bring forth what? Fruit. That's what the whole purpose in life of is, is, is bringing forth fruit. If you don't, a fig tree that won't bring forth fruit, Christ said, chop her down. Get rid of her. God is the, Christ is the vine and we're the branches. You either produce fruit or God is the pruner. Whack, you're gone. Okay. So you earnestly talk to him, pray to him, and receive that latter rain and produce fruit by it. Verse 19, brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, Verse 20, to complete the chapter, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, with God's help, of course, and shall hide a multitude of sins, meaning it causes God to bless you and, and to redeem you from your own sins. In other words, when you do God's work and when you are blessed by that, when you receive that latter rain and when you don't let it grow stale. Well, what do you mean by that, brother? When you receive the latter rain, you share it. You put it out where people can hear it. You put it out where people can grow by it. This is what you call producing fruit. Fruit fit, if you would, for the consumption of Almighty God, bringing those people in, redeeming those souls. That's what it's all about. That's what a fruit provider is, is one that can receive that rain, can share it willingly. Don't be one of these that, well, I've got a little light, I'm going to put a bushel over it. Well, what good is that? Don't ever do that. Share what you have. If God gives you something, share it. That brings forth fruit, and that brings forth the blessings of God. So there you have it. Now I want to reiterate one more time. Elijah was a common man. Just like, I mean, the same things that hit you hit him. But he understood prophecy. But the important thing is he prayed earnestly for that latter rain, conviction, truth, and God used him. He brought forth the rain. See that you do. Book of James named Jacob in the Hebrew to the 12 tribes what, and to the world. Hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed bringing it. Book of James, listen a moment, won't you please. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, share it. Once you do that, please never ask a question about a particular reverend or denomination. We do not judge people. Judgment belongs to our Father. Boy, He is good at it. He gets it done. We don't. He doesn't need our help in that department. You can spiritually discern, though. That's called intelligence. It's a gift from God. It's how you use it, who you should listen to, who you should fellowship with, and how you should cut your own way. 
Those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Always a pleasure. Now, got a prayer request, don't need the number, don't need an address. Why? Your father's listening to you. He even knows what you're thinking. You're studying his word. It makes his day, and he loves you for that. So let him know that you love him in return. Won't you do that? And let him know what it is that you need. Tell him. Talk to him. That's what prayer is. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. Uh, Wilma from Delaware, I would like to know if 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34 and 35, verses 34 and 35, apply to women today as it did the women in the Bible. Yes, it does. But first you need to understand what it says. Because it is, unfortunately, it takes a really good Greek scholar to catch what I'm about to say. But it is a fact as God is my witness. In verse 34, the second time that, uh, that the, the singular speech comes up, do you know what that word is in the Greek? It's chatter. No, a woman should not chatter like a little bird. Peaky, 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 peaky. Okay. I don't allow men to chatter in God's house when the message is being taught. Now, if, if you're good enough a scholar, you can catch that. You've got to go to the manuscripts. The Strong's won't even help you a whole lot on this. You've got to be a Greek scholar. But you will find that with no reasonable doubt whatsoever, but what's absolute, it says a woman shouldn't chatter in church. And you know something? They shouldn't to this day. They never were allowed to. But you know what? There were many women preachers, teachers, and it seems like that people forget to bring up those particular verses. Nathan had four virgin daughters. Virgins I mean they never had a man. They were on their own, and they were prophetess. A prophet teaches. Or a woman should keep her head covered when she prophesies. Teaches. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And so, so, it, so there you go. It's properly translating the word saves a lot of pain and misery. Um, it is what I have just said is an absolute fact. And the manuscripts back it up 100% what I just stated. Uh, she left from Tennessee. I am a new student. I would like to know where in the Bible I can find that Cain and Abel were from two different fathers. Abel from Adam and Cain from the devil. Well, you'll find out that Cain, his offspring, the first murder, you know who the first murderer was? It was Cain. And Jesus himself would tell you in St. John chapter 8, verse 44, your father, who was the first murderer, was a child of the devil. And that does not mean spiritually. It means um, seed, sperma, male sperm. Now, um, also, uh, another way, you know, when Adam's genealogy is given, all of his children are listed right there. You can read it in chapter 5, the great book of Genesis. Well, is Cain in it? No, it isn't. No, he isn't. Cain has a different genealogy. Why? Because he had a different father. It pays one to think and to consider if Cain is not in Adam's genealogy, he was not Adam's son. Well, it says right there in verse chapter 4, verse 1, that Adam knew his wife and she conceived young Abel. But the conception of Cain had already taken place. Two separate pregnancies, same twins. Uh, Charles from Virginia. Pastor Murray, my parents were married 50 years. My mom has since passed away and my father remarried. The family is upset with this. Are there any scriptures that might help this situation? Thank you. This, this is kind of, you know, um, hearts, Christian hearts should be big enough that you don't put somebody away 
out of your heart and mind just because they pass on or because the father would marry another wife. You have a Christian heart that can enlarge and in love because he loves her. He wouldn't have married her probably. I, I'm not knowing the details, but you could enlarge your hearts and love her too. There's, he's, there's room, you know, in a Christian heart to love. It's not replacing somebody. It's making room for them. So um, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, I could say many things if the father is getting on up in years, it beats putting him in a nursing home or you having to take care of him. He's got, got a mate and the two of them, they can make it. It's a good thing, uh, companionship. So I think the family really needs to have a Christian talk with each other and realize this woman is not trying to take your mother's place, but she's trying to find a place for herself. So let it be. Uh, Georgia from, no, Gloria, rather, I'm sorry, Gloria from Florida. Is there someone besides Pastor Murray? Let's see what we got. Everyone I know, all the Christian programs I watch say we're going to be raptured. Is there someone besides Pastor Murray who has a different idea of it? Absolutely, it's Almighty God. Almighty God says there's no rapture. So you kind of have it this way. Who do you believe, God or people? Okay. The word rapture is not even in the Bible. It's placed there. It didn't get there until the year 1830. And it was put there by the actions of a very sick woman. So, you know, it's just up to you. You know, whatever, whatever um, uh, cranks your engine, all right? That'll do it. But I, I'll, I'll choose God every time, okay? His blessings. Uh, Betty from Florida. Question, please explain Luke 14, 26. I just don't get it. Thank you. Luke 14, 26. You must hate your mother, father, father brother, sister more than me, or you can't be my disciple. Naturally, the reason you can't understand it, there's an era here. And, and you should know that. So all you do is take your Strong's Concordance, take that word hate, take it back to the Greek, and what does it say? Well, it says love less. Well, there's a lot of difference in love less than hate. So then what did Christ really say in Luke 14 there? He said, you must, if you're going to follow me, if you're going to dedicate your life to picking up your cross and following Christ, you've got to love me more than mother, brother, father, sister. And quite frankly, you should anyway. He died on the cross for you. You should love him more than anyone else. But to follow him, you know, there's a lot of heartaches in, in uh, picking up that, that word and taking the, the uh, uh, fallout that can come against Christianity. But it's a pleasure to serve him even with that. Martin from Nevada. Pastor Murray, I take prescription medications for medical reasons. I would like to know if this is a sin. Will I not go to heaven? That, that has nothing to do with your going to heaven whatsoever, okay? Luke, the very author of the gospel under Almighty God, was a physician. He was a medical doctor. Many of his, much of his, you can always, he was a scribe for Paul in much of Paul's writings. And you can always spot Luke because he uses medical terminology in, his, in describing uh, things, and which makes it very clear and easy to understand, but it puts his thumbprint all over it. So, so God certainly has nothing against medical doctors or he wouldn't have used Luke. Okay. Uh, but uh, certainly um, God gave us medications, herbs and plants for our own benefit um, and certainly there's nothing wrong with that. Leonard from Wisconsin. Pastor Murray, if 1,000 years is equal to one day with the Lord, then how does one half hour of the time equal five months? I must be doing my math wrong. It's not your math that's wrong. It's your kind of misunderstanding 
and mixing up um, bolts with nuts, okay? The thousand years is a day with the Lord. That's a millennium, and that's the way it is with him, but it has nothing to do with man, basically. But when he teaches man about the one hour of temptation, that's where the half hour comes in. It's a whole different subject, okay? Whole different subject. You'll pick up that hour in Revelation chapter 17, where it says the Antichrist can only have one hour, of, which means the hour of temptation, and that hour happens to be five months long. Broken up, if you would, into two, two and a half period times, half hour each, and, and then you'd be cooking pretty good. Uh, Carrie from Texas. I have seen many prophecies come to pass in my lifetime. I am wondering, with all that is going on in the world today with Egypt and Syria, the United States, and so on, is the political beast rising? Has it risen? Thank you very much for your teaching. You are quite a comfort to me in the Word. Well, thank you. The Word does that. You know, this coming week, um, you will be seeing the lectures given at Passover. One of them will be the swarmers, or it has to do with the locusts, and it has to do with all these nations you've just mentioned, but how the locusts are already swarming. You don't want to miss that. And the second lecture will be on the deadly wound, honing in and zeroing in. So next week, do not miss that. It ties many loose ends together from the book of Revelation as well as other scriptures in the Word of God to bring your current events up to biblical prophecies whereby you can better understand the end times. We have a much going on at this time, and it's important that you know the swarming of the locust and what's happening. Uh, Ty from Nevada. What? What is it in Amos chapter 8 that tells you it's talking about the end times? Amos chapter 8, usually I quote verse, what is it, 13, which states, 11 or 13, which states um, that the famine of the end times is not for bread, but for hearing the word of God. Now, you know it's the end times because of verse 2, because it's when the fig tree is present and this is the fig tree generation, the last one. Rob, Roberta from Montana, where in the Bible does it say that the Antichrist will only be here for five months? Revelation chapter nine, and it gives you the Antichrist name in both languages, Hebrew and Greek, whereby you uh, know definitely who he is. Lois from Georgia, Will all of the elect still be here and alive during the sixth trump when Antichrist arrives? Absolutely, that's their purpose, that's their destiny, is to be delivered up and to witness against the false Messiah so that the whole world can hear the truth. As it is written in Mark 13, it is not they that speak, but the Holy Spirit speaks through them when they're delivered up before the synagogue of Satan. and. This being the church of Smyrna and Philadelphia, as it's listed in Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, and, and uh, 310, concerning those two churches, God's elect, or, or make up those um, people. Pearly from Georgia, is there anything wrong with doing counseling in a group setting and everyone discussing the problems? Only always remember, you know, if you have a problem, sometimes a, a counseling can be done in that way. But always remember, when you have many sets of hear, ears, if you have something that is between you and God, I would not say it in front of too many ears because it could come back to haunt you. Otherwise, if it is a group for uh, a like habit, or a like conviction of some kind, then certainly it's fine. It's uh, counseling, group counseling is quite good because it's kind of like uh, you might have seen an example of it in today's lecture. Elijah is a common man like we are. So uh, you like company in something, knowing that um, 
there are likenesses in people and together we can handle it, okay? You can encourage each other. Nathan from Georgia, when will, when will God set fire to the earth? God's not going to set fire to the earth. I think you're probably quoting Second uh, Peter chapter three verse ten. It says he, that with fervent heat, he destroys the elements. That's the rudiments, okay, not the world. You, you would be, uh, you know, he's coming to this earth to set his kingdom up right here on earth. So he's not going to set it on fire. Now he will create a lake of fire somewhere on this earth at the end of the millennium. And all that do not overcome are going to go into the lake. That is known in the book of Revelation, chapter 20, last verses, as the second death. It's the death of the soul. God loves this earth. In Ezekiel chapter 16, he made an eternal covenant with the Mount Zion, Jerusalem, where he intends to set his eternal temple. So he's sure not going to set it on fire, okay? Cynthia from Florida. My question is, during the millennium, who will Christ and his saints reign over? People in spiritual bodies or physical bodies? I thank you for the answer. At the seventh trump, which is the first day of the millennium, every living being is changed into a spiritual body. So we will all, both those that are reigning and the reignees, are all in spiritual bodies. Satan is locked in a pit where he can have no negative influence whatsoever on anyone, anywhere, anytime until he is released a short season. That makes it real easy to teach when you don't have negative factors present. That's going to be a good time for teaching. Well, where does it say that? Revelation chapter 20, verse 5, we will be priests with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead will remain dead until they're tested, meaning spiritually dead, meaning they have not overcome. Okay, and um, uh, we go with, let me find a name here, Carl from Michigan. Could you please explain why Easter is at the different time each year? I thought it was with the sun's position, but I'm wrong with the spring equinox. I love you. No, you're right. Don't, just because man's calendar of moons says Easter is later in April somewhere, we don't go by moons. That's darkness. Moons, all, every prophecy given concerning Satan is given in moons, months. Okay. You don't want to go there. Example, Revelation chapter 13, verse 4, 5, Satan has 42 months, 42 moons. But what about the two witnesses? They have 1,260 days, sunlight, days, because why? We're children of light. So naturally, we go by the sun solar calendar because we are children of light. God's Word stipulates that Passover, which Ishtar is a pagan name of a pagan holiday, a fertility goddess, which every spring they met out in the forest for fertility reasons, camped out. It was an orgy of rolling eggs of fertility. And so it was. And Preachers brought that into the church because it brought a crowd. And, you know, every preacher likes a crowd. But if he's not really a man of God, a man of God is a little bit particular what is taught and where it came from. You know, most good college Webster's dictionaries will tell you that Easter came from Ishtar, a pagan holiday. It's not that difficult to find truth if you look for it, okay? So always go from the spring equinox begins the new year. Fourteen days later, the 15th day is Passover. And then run by 50 more days and you have Pentecost. And 50, 50, and um, short of 14 days, you have the fall fellowship.
you have the, the Feast of Tabernacles. In, and at the end of that set of 50, then at the end of seven fifties, you have 365 days, counting the 14 you waited for Passover. Full year, a solar year. That's God's calendar. And that's what we go by. Not moons for Satan. Sandy from California, I've heard you say, God bless, he will bless you. Being only a speck in the great cosmos, I don't know how. I keep learning more, share teachings with a few others. I've repented and I try to live by his word. Is this what you mean or is it something? No, that, that's good. You, you study his word and you stick with it, Sandy, and he's going to bless you. All right. That's, that's our father. Do, do you know why he does that? Because he loves you. If you read Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4, all souls, that means Sandy's soul, belongs to God. You're his child. And he loves his children. Especially when you're trying like you are. It makes his day. And boy, does he have time for you. Talk to him. Let him know you love him in return. And I'm out of time. I love you because you enjoy studying our Father's Word. Don't miss the lectures this next week about the locust swarming and the deadly wound. You need to know it, so don't miss it. Uh, most of all, God loves you for studying His Word. Makes His day when you make His day. Boy, is He going to make yours. Now, we are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always bless you. His word is so complete. His word is final. Yea, yea, nay, nay. Right on. Follow him. Most important, though, most important though, you listen to me, you stay in his word. That's what's important. Every day in it's a good day, even with trouble. Why? Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you.